Well, welcome to the show, Debbie. It's great to have you. Oh, thanks so much. I'm really excited to be here. I appreciate it. And I know you have a personal story with burnout that might be the impetus for the book. I'd love to hear about your own struggle with burnout and how you overcame it. Oh, yeah. I mean, it definitely is one of those things where you end up learning about something because you care about it because it impacts your own life. I spent the first part of my career as a psychologist on a medical team in a hospital and worked there for many years very happily and loved it for the most part. But I hit a pretty bad burnout stage where I was just really stressed out. And we know that burnout always happens in the context of chronic stress. And it was just one of those periods of time where there had been some transitions at work that I was dealing with. I had two young kids at home. I was managing a whole bunch of various things in my life. And it actually took me a while to recognize that I was burned out. I think I just felt like I was always behind, always behind. And I hadn't really noticed how much I had gotten to this point of just being really it just felt like a grind, right? I felt really exhausted. I felt just not that spark of passion that I normally feel for my work. And it wasn't until this day I was sitting in my colleague's office and she was, we we're trying to figure out some administrative stuff. And I just was like, I don't care. I just did not care at all. And that's very unlike me usually. And because that happened, I had this light bulb moment where I'm like, I'm really burnt out. I had been burnt out for a while and didn't realize it. And at that point, I was able to make some changes to just be more aware of what was going on. And I got to a better place. It eventually, you know, it takes a while sometimes to get out of burnout. But because of that, I got really interested in burnout. And so many of my coworkers and colleagues had had burnout. And eventually, to make a very long story short, I ended up leaving that position later, not because I was burnt out, but just because I was ready for a change and ended up specializing in my clinical practice in burnout. So most of the people that come into my office are experiencing chronic stress and and or burnout. So because of that, I really dove into it. Like, what do we know about burnout? How do you work with burnout? It's quite complex as a psychologist. I was trying to learn as much as I could to be able to help people. And that's really what got me into the book. And then, of course, we had COVID. And so burnout just became everywhere. It was already a problem, but then because of COVID, it just became a huge problem for so many people. And so that led to the book. And here I am. I feel like for a lot of people, it's easier to see burnout in others than in themselves. And obviously, being a psychologist and having studied how the mind works, you would think you would recognize the signs almost before anyone else. Why is that when we're in almost this like boiling the frog scenario with burnout, when we're actually experiencing it, it's not obvious to us, but our loved ones, our coworkers, our family might be the first to spot it? My experience, and I don't know if this is true for everyone, but I think one of the things that happens with burnout is that people blame themselves. People think, you know, if I could just catch up, if I could just manage stress better, if I was more resilient, if I was tougher, if I, so I, I think I fell into that trap a little bit myself where I just really felt like, I always felt like I was right around the corner from being less stressed out. Once I get through this project, once I get these things done off of my to-do list, my stress level will go down. And so I was think I was so immersed in that way of thinking that it didn't occur to me that I was burnt out. I just thought, oh, I'm not keeping up. I'm almost through this. And and so I think that's part of what it is, is that we just, we think that we're not doing a good enough job of keeping up instead of thinking like, oh, I'm burnt out. And it makes sense that I'm burnt out because of the situation I'm in. So now in hindsight, are you able to identify those work stressors that were adding up for you? And then can you explain or define some of those for our audience? Burnout always happens in a context of chronic stress, and some of the things that we know contribute. One is obvious, which is just a really high workload where you don't have the resources to keep up with the demands that are on you over the course of time. So it's not just a one-time stressor, right? It's you're always too busy. In my particular case, I mean, I think hospitals are known for this. There's so much administrative work. I was working with trainees. I just had constant you know, patients coming in, I had to be going to this meeting and that meeting. I think that sometimes also feeling unappreciated at work or feeling like you don't have enough support. And because I had been through this 
transition recently, I think my very close cohesive team got changed. It just happened, you know, and and I think that the support I was getting, this feeling of connection was lower at that particular point in time. And I think that made a difference. In my case, I was working part-time at that period because I had very young kids at home and I had reduced my hours, but I don't think that my workload shifted very much. And I think anyone who's worked part-time can probably relate to this. A lot of the demands that you have, you're just trying to do all the administrative work and so on. It didn't change. And so I think that those are the types of factors you often see with people. Some I've heard it called micro stressors before. There's actually a book that recently came out about this, where it's those little day-to-day things, you know, you get stuck in traffic and you can't find a parking spot and the printer jams and you have to fill out this this paperwork that's due today. And meanwhile, you're trying to do your day job and you're in meetings all the time. Those kinds of things just start to take a toll. And after a while, they just deplete you. You feel fatigued. I think that's important for our audience to realize that it's it's not the big elephant that is in the room that is is adding the stress. Sure, it's making life difficult. You have a lot to do, but it is all the little things that are compounding on the day. And And the other thing that you said that I find interesting is that you had lost the people you were connected with when you had changed roles. And those people played a role in allowing you to talk through what you were dealing with, what you were feeling. And the little micro interactions that we have day to day that allow us to feel good about what we're doing and where we are and where we're heading. And I think along with that, there's a prolonged lack of a sense of achievement. So even, as you said, feeling unsupported, you know, those small moments where coworkers would say, hey, great job on that. Thank you for handling that meeting or thank you for moving this project forward. If there's this prolonged sense of a lack of achievement, monotony, and being weighed down by things that you don't feel fill you up or allow you to feel like there's growth and momentum in the right direction, we see this a lot in our clients where there's a tendency to make themselves busy and fill space to try to find that moment of control and achievement in their life. And oftentimes that prolonged sense of just overwhelming busyness, but not moving ahead in your career, not seeing a work project to completion, not seeing you know your kids develop in the way that you want or the household chores getting managed to the degree that you would like, that prolonged sense really weighs on you in that chronic stress environment. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think one thing you're saying is really important there around how we sometimes stay busy and try really hard to focus on getting things done in order to almost to outrun the chronic stress, but that that's the very thing that keeps us so stressed out all the time. We almost feel like, well, if I can just get all these things done and and then I won't have to feel this way anymore. But in doing so, that leads to burnout. And so does isolation. As you were saying, it's, you know, one of the things that happened to me when I was burned out is that I I kind of withdrew from the people that were still there and the new people that I was interacting with. I didn't make time to talk to them because I was just not feeling energized enough. But by being more isolated in the long run, that contributed as well. So you get into these cycles around it, I think, where the behaviors you're engaging in, they seem like what you need to do to get yourself out of this situation. Like, well, if I just go into my office and close the door and work as hard as I can, but then all the joy is gone and the stress is even higher. So in the book, you defined 10 burnout cycles. And as I was going through them, I picked out the ones that are most common that we see in our clients and that we hear from our audience, which to me, the busy bee, the perfectionist, the people pleaser, the marching soldier, and the overanalyzer. So if you wouldn't mind defining a couple of those for us so that our audience can can identify or at least understand if if they're uh, one of these identities. The busy bee, I think we talked about, right? It's where you just stay busy. Yes. Yeah. The perfectionist, it's funny with perfectionism because if you look underneath perfectionism, it's really all about control. I think often people have this sense that if I can do everything just right, 
and perfectly, then I won't have to feel this anxiety. But you can see how perfectionism absolutely leads to chronic stress and burnout because it's it's impossible, you know? It's impossible. Um, it's impossible. You'll just never get there. And you'll you'll really drive yourself bananas trying. The one that I called the marching soldier, I think we can probably all relate to that a little bit too. It's where you just feel like you have to just carry on and keep going and I can't stop until you're just at the end of the day, you collapse because you've got nothing left. But that sense of like, I can't stop. I can't take a break. I just have to keep going. I have to keep pushing. It's kind of the stoic type of mm -hmm. approach to things. Yes, Absolutely. I think that one is the one that AJ and I probably identify with just from growing up in the Midwest and having factory dads. <laughs> mm. Yes, I could see that. Yeah, and the thought that just hard work can work your way out of it when in actuality it could spin it up even worse. Absolutely. Well, and I think one problem with the marching soldier approach is that there's no room for a break. There's no room to just stop and feel what you feel, which in my opinion is one of the things that can help with burnout is to give yourself that space to just tune into your emotions and to sit with how you feel even when it's hard. But when you're marching on and on and on, you just don't allow for that. These last two are certainly, uh, these come up a lot. We see them all the time. So people pleasing and the over analyzer. People pleasing is big with burnout because I think what happens is that you get a lot of reinforcement for saying yes to things and putting other people's needs first. And it's, it's not a bad quality to have at a certain level, because usually we want to be generous and kind and caring. But I think when you're really stuck in people pleasing, often you sacrifice yourself in order to make other people happy, or you have trouble saying no, or you're always running yourself ragged trying to make everyone else happy with what you're doing. And so one of the things I often see with my clients with burnout is that they need to learn how to set boundaries and say no. And it's not that you don't want to sometimes do nice things for other people or say yes, but you need to be really intentional about it. And I think sometimes people err really far on the side of always trying to make other people happy. So it's a big skill, I think, when, when you're talking about burnout prevention is learning to say no. What I've also noticed here is, and perhaps this was your the wording that you wanted to use, but these are identities that people can feel good about. Who doesn't want to be the busy bee? Who doesn't want to be the marching soldier who can take on anything? Some of the other ones you mentioned was like the do-gooder, right? Well, who doesn't want to be a do-gooder? These are all things, uh, the perfectionists. Who doesn't want to be perfect? Who doesn't want to put their best efforts in? So these are identities that, that people can take on and where as their, their badge of courage and honor and ability to, to feel good about themselves. But again, these also then lead you astray in how you're viewing the world and your work and how you must go through it. Yeah. And it is such a double-edged sword, I think, with some of these where it slips past the point where something that actually is a good quality, caring about your work, wanting to do a good job, wanting to put a lot of effort into your work can slip past the point. Actually, Joan Halifax, I cited this in my book, she, she's a Buddhist scholar. You might have seen her name around. She has a few books out there and she describes them as edge states. So for instance, actually we'll go with the overthinker because we didn't get to that one yet. It can be really helpful to, to use your mind to solve problems and to think things through and to be rational and smart about things. But it can easily slip into this edge state of just the wheels constantly turning, trying to solve your problems by overthinking. And the next thing you know, you're preoccupied, ruminating, worrying, and you're just stuck up in your head and, and not really getting anywhere. But you could see how that can be a helpful trait in some circumstances. But if you go too far with it, it gets to the point where it's contributing to burnout. You're just constantly up in your head and you're maybe even having trouble just being really centered and focused on what's going on in the moment. 
And listening to your body, right? right? I think a large part of this is the disconnect from all the warning signs that your body is sharing with you around how the chronic stress is appearing, the lack of sleep, the lethargy, the inability to do the things that you normally enjoy doing. Maybe that's working out. Maybe that's seeing friends. You talked about withdrawing. And sometimes it's drawing you into really negative patterns and habits, like a couple extra glasses of wine to take the edge off, maybe some drug use to get away from the anxiety. And of course, these when it's coming from our body, if we stay up in our head and we're only listening to the signals and thought patterns in our head, it's very hard to even recognize those warning signs that we're on a path to burnout. Absolutely. You can just miss those indicators of, okay, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I'm too stressed, I need to exercise, I need to get some more sleep, I need to prioritize some of my own self-care. And yeah, absolutely. What you just said makes me think of a scenario where someone might realize, okay, there's burnout in my life. I need to slow down. I need to bring some self-care in and have that then be an added stressor to the entire situation where now not only do you need to do your work and take care of the family and all the other tasks, now on top of all of that, you also need to be in bed by 9 p.m. You need to read 10 pages in a novel you like. You need to watch this show on Netflix and you have to have some ice cream. And I can imagine that this is something where people are trying to solve a problem a certain way, but they're just adding to the already existing problem that's there. That's right. I think that that is a lot of conventional advice about burnout is about that. You know, it's these quick fixes. Well, take time to do yoga, take time to do more self-care, get more sleep. And those are those are fine. Those can be really good and life enhancing, but first of all, they're they're a little bit maybe not going to solve the real problem, which often has more to do with the context that you're in, just the chronic stress of the world we're living in. And yes, it can start to feel like one more thing you have to already add to your busy plate. And, and often people do those things and they might feel better for a while, but it doesn't necessarily solve the burnout. And this is where there's a lot of controversy you might have seen these days around things like mindfulness interventions that workplaces sometimes put into practice. And the problem isn't so much that they're doing those things. You know, oh, we're offering free yoga, free mindfulness, free five-minute massages, that's great and fine. But what's not happening is any change to the conditions that are driving burnout. So your workload's still the same. You're not getting paid more. We're not reducing the number of meetings you have to sit in every day. We're not changing anything about the environment, but now you're supposed to add this. So it's not really addressing the real problem. And if, if you still struggle with the issue after all those fancy interventions, uh, it's obviously your fault because you should just meditate a little bit more or a little bit harder. Yeah, you're not doing enough. Mm -hmm. It could feel like a Chinese finger trap where you are pulling to get more of that space in your life. Maybe it's the meditation, maybe it's adding the exercise, but it's actually just creating even more tension and pressure on that already busy schedule of yours. If the actual chronic stress that's coming from communication at work, workload, meetings, the way that people are treating each other, the culture, working out more, sleeping more doesn't actually address what's going on in that environment. And I think along with what you were saying earlier, it can be very difficult for many of us who are overachievers to not only ask for help, but in an environment where people are being laid off, people's performance is being judged. And we see in the economy that, you know, maybe the job prospects aren't that great. And there's a worry that if I raise my hand and say, hey, you know, this isn't working for me, or, or this is a stressful environment that I'm not able to operate my best in, the simple solution for the company may be to say, okay, well, might be time for you to find another job. Yeah. And I think that, that that economic framework, let's just call it that, right? This culture in which we live is a big part of the problem here because I think we're all afraid of that. We all feel like we have to earn a living, of course, and provide for ourselves and our families if we have one. And so there's this pressure to keep our job. And when that becomes the expectation and the norm, you know, and then you feel like you have to kind of keep hustling away to just to keep up. And so this is where it really is a more of a cultural problem. And people end up feeling stuck. You know, they feel like, well, what can I do about that? Because I can't quit my job. Or if I don't 
achieve at this certain level of performance, I might lose my job. And that's really scary. And so it's a, yeah, it's a really a bind for people. Yeah. And I've witnessed this in, in my wife's situation. And it's again, easier, as I said earlier, to see it in others where some of these concerns start to be brought up and the promises are, well, let's just get through the holiday season or let's get through Black Friday or we're going to make those changes in Q1 of next year and Q2, don't worry, we're hiring more help. And you, it can just feel like you're staring into the abyss. Like, hey, I raised this concern. I've tried to communicate it in a way that's team focused, not just about myself. And the solutions just feel further and further out and don't actually feel, as you were saying earlier, get at the root of the problem. You know, free massages sound great. A little bit of extra help with childcare sounds great at the surface. But if your workload and chronic stress is at an all time high, uh, those are just handling some symptoms and not the root issue. Yeah. That's right. In that regard, I'm, I'm curious, would you say that a burnout in these days is over or underdiagnosed, even if we include self-diagnoses as well? Uh, you know, that is a great question. And I, I don't really know the answer to it because I do think there's a lot of talk about burnout. And I, I actually think sometimes people use the word burnout to describe things that aren't very severe. And there's no real criteria for this. So it's I don't know if it's right or wrong, but people say, oh, I'm so burnt out when they're just having a couple of rough days. And I tend to think about it as more of a chronic thing, like burnout is pretty, has a big impact on your life when it's really extreme burnout and it, and it tends to last a while. It's kind of hard to move out of it. So in that sense, maybe it's a little bit overdiagnosed, which is that people are using that term pretty freely. But I also think at the same time, there's a lot of people out there who are chronically stressed and probably at least teetering on the edge of burnout who aren't really saying much about it. So it, that's a great question, Michael. And I don't know. I, I, I think we're seeing more conversations about it and more acknowledgement of it, which in my mind is a really good thing because that is one thing that could potentially move the needle on this a little bit is for people to talk about it. And some of the conversations we're seeing in the media these days about things like, quote, quiet quitting, where people are just saying, I'm not going above and beyond at work anymore. The cost is too high. I think that those kinds of conversations are actually helpful, even though some people might have a issue with that. They don't like that concept. That's fine. But people are just talking more about it. And in my mind, that's a really important step is let's just discuss what's happening here culturally. That might move the needle more than we realize. Well, regardless of it being people identifying it and way too much or uh, under uh, diagnosing it, uh, there are great tools To, that you've put in the book to deal with this either or. So we should get into those. And the, the first part of that, and we've talked about this multiple times on the show, but it's incredibly important, which is psychological flexibility. So if you can define that for our audience, so we can go from there. Yeah. Psychological flexibility. This concept comes from acceptance and commitment therapy, which is my, my book is an act for burnout book. I think that there's a few different pieces of psychological flexibility that are important here. It's really about being able to feel your feelings and have your thoughts come and go from a place of awareness and openness and being really present with what is. Instead of struggling against it, it's allowing it and being sort of open and aware of your inner experience. And I think there can be a bit of a transformation there when it comes to burnout, which is, again, instead of detaching or disengaging, it's allowing yourself to feel all of this, but from a place of openness and awareness instead of getting caught up in that internal struggle. And then it's also about moving toward your values and toward whatever a meaningful life is to you in an effective way. So very centered on your values and what's going to give you a sense of purpose and noticing when you're caught in some behavior patterns that might not be so helpful so that you can respond effectively to whatever the situation happens to be. And that can look like all kinds of different things. I mean, all kinds of behavior patterns that might not necessarily be helping with the problem of burnout. So in looking at those personas earlier, it sounds like a lot of those personas move you away from your emotions and give you a reason to disassociate or not engage with them, whether it be perfectionism or people-pleasing or being the busy bee, 
we're doing activities and taking actions that don't actually deal with the emotions that we're feeling. We're acting out of a sense of trying to fulfill this identity or trying to fulfill others' wants and needs of us. So if you're in that situation, this idea of like, okay, well, recognizing these emotions, understanding and bringing some empathy and compassion to myself around these emotions, that can feel very intimidating for someone who's worked very hard to avoid feeling and recognizing emotions. So if you're in that situation, what are some of the steps we can take to start to identify, recognize these emotions and process them in a more healthy way than getting more busy, <laughs> being more of a perfectionist or procrastinating? Yeah. I mean, every single one of those examples has at its root some sort of control or avoidance component, right? So you're trying really hard to reduce your stress or to feel better or to, you know, in the short term, a lot of these things do feel better. And so the first step, you know, you really need some awareness. First, you need to notice, okay, I'm in this cycle. It's not really working for me. Maybe it is driven by some sort of control or avoidance. So having that awareness. And then the, here's the hard thing. This is maybe the bad news for people who are listening is that you also have to be willing to face that discomfort that's showing up that you're trying so hard to avoid. You know, so you may, there may be some sense of, oh, I don't really want to do that because the thing that's hard for me is really uncomfortable. You know, it might be stress, it could be anxiety, fear, in some types of roles, it could be, you know, sadness or just your own fears about your own abilities or something like that. And so when you're starting to shift some of this, sometimes it's pretty uncomfortable to step out of those patterns. For instance, if the perfectionist lets go and says, okay, this is good enough. I'm going to, you know, submit this and go home. They might feel a sense of, oh, I don't know, anxiety around whether it was good enough or not. And and I think that can be really hard for people or the, the people pleaser saying no for the first time to their boss, I can't do that project. Ooh, that's going to be really painful. And so that skill of willingness to feel, that's probably the primary thing that that I'm suggesting. And that is so counterintuitive as well. I mean, I can imagine that right now, everyone listening is like face palming and going like, what is this? What are they telling me? Like, I should feel all of that yucky stuff. I've been working years to get away from it. If I'm finally productive enough, if I'm finally competent enough, then I don't have to feel that stuff anymore. But here's, here's the catch. If you busy yourself day in and day out, running away from that stuff, you can't move towards towards what is really important for you, what is really giving meaning to your life. Because most of the time, you're just trying to numb out, run away, avoid and control all of these emotions. And 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 what you are saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is to, to open the door and say, hey, look, I have a lot of important stuff to do. I know that I'm going to feel perfectionistic or anxious or stressed out about this. But why don't I allow that stuff to just sit there next to me while I'm doing those things that are very important so we don't add that struggle against the thoughts, against the emotions to our goal pursuit and our value pursuit? I think in a lot of our clients that we work with directly, anger is one of those emotions, especially as men that they're trying to control and move away from. And unfortunately, that those actions that they're taking, whether it's working hard or packing their schedule, or maybe it's numbing with some substances, the anger then spills out in other areas. It might be in your personal relationships. It might be towards your spouse. It might be towards your coworkers in a very passive aggressive way in your communication style. And oftentimes it's really hard to identify, I'm just feeling angry about the situation that I'm in. I'm angry that I'm not achieving. I'm angry that I hadn't gotten that promotion this year. I'm angry that that project failed. And we find ourselves trapped by that anger, but it's really scary to admit that you actually are angry, especially as a man. Yeah. And I think that anger is such a fascinating emotion. Actually, as I go in on my career, I, I'm i more and more interested in anger, I would say, because I think that, yeah, people have to use their anger effectively. I often see people with burnout who are very irritated, just very frustrated and angry. But if you ask yourself, and you know, it can be unhelpful when people get really stuck in anger, but if you ask yourself, what's my anger telling me about what's going on here? 
I mean, sometimes it's just random. Like, I don't like that person cutting me off in traffic or something like that. You know, it's not that deep. But sometimes it actually can be deep. Like, if you're chronically angry in your work role, there might be some sense of injustice or there's something about this situation that's not working for me, or maybe your boundaries are being violated. I I actually love to tune into it in a sense of, is there some wisdom in my anger? And if you can step back from anger a little bit and get some distance from that hot, you know, adrenaline feeling of anger, you can actually use it to think about, okay, what needs to change here? Do I need to speak up about something? Is there something going on here that's just not working for me? And if so, what am I going to do about it? With that, I think the problem that we see time and time again, and we we talked about ACT, and we are huge fans of ACT, but when some of our listeners hear ACT for the first time, they hear acceptance. And it's like, well, <laughs> I just have to accept the situation. I have to accept what's out of my control. And acceptance isn't actually in that definition what we're talking about here around what's causing the burnout. Sometimes accepting the things you can't change might actually mean you have to make a change in terms of change in career, change in location, change in an environment. It's not just a blanket statement of, well, take whatever the world sends your way and be a doormat level of acceptance. It's certainly about creating change. If we don't accept the situation and to have a radical acceptance of it, then how can we begin to take responsibility to do the things that we need to do to make those changes? And the other thing about anger, and I, I find it utterly fascinating, is that anger is one of the emotions that pushes you outside of your natural behaviors because it is a survival mechanism. It is there to protect you. So you're going to do things when you're angry that are uncharacteristically you, which f freaks people out because they're going into the unknown. They're using behaviors that they're not comfortable with and, and they're going to see a side of them that, that they've never seen before. And that can scare them. But I think for some, it could actually thrill them a bit as well. And so because of that, it can be scary. But if we're going to need to create change, if we're going to need to do things uh, and go into the unknown for the first time, well, anger is a great motivator. Anger is a great place to start to push you into the arena so you can do the things you need to do. I think most importantly, though, you just don't want it to consume you to where that's all you see is anger. Yeah, I think sometimes people get so stuck in that righteous anger and it can, as you're saying, it can feel really powerful and sometimes actually feels kind of good to be in that place. I just read a study about this recently and I can't, I can't remember the source off the top of my head, but about how people who have a little bit of anger often will be out in the world doing important things, right? It can of course. It can drive social change. So it can actually be really channeled for good, but you do have to be a little careful there because it can also get you into all kinds of trouble. Of course, it's, I'm sure everyone's aware it can be problematic, but you know, if you channel it effectively, it can, it can be your friend. So when we think about acceptance commitment therapy for our audience who may not be familiar, why do you believe it's such a great way to make our way through and manage burnout if we're actually feeling some of those symptoms and, and frustrations we've talked about earlier? Well, there's a couple of reasons why I really think, to me, it's the best clinical fit for, for working with burnout and for helping people prevent burnout, in part because it's very contextual. And so in the acceptance and commitment therapy philosophy and framework, all human behavior makes sense in context. And I think that's very much true for burnout. You really have to look at the situation and the context and what's driving it and it makes sense to have burnout if you're in a chronically stressful situation. And so I think it actually adds a dose of self-compassion because people can say, it's not my fault. It makes sense that I'm feeling this way and that this is happening to me. And then also acceptance and commitment therapy is really about helping people engage in their lives in a meaningful way. And that's what it comes down to. That's the ultimate goal in acceptance and commitment therapy. And because burnout, one of the hallmarks of burnout is the sense of detachment and disengagement. I think the goal is the same. You know, if you want to get out of burnout, it's because you want to 
enjoy your life. You know, you want to live fully. And when you're burnt out, you're just not. And so I think that the the philosophy of ACT and the goal of ACT really fits with what's happening with burnout. And we can we can add here, because um, we're using ACT so much in our coaching programs as well, that I feel like there's so much to talk about when it comes to ACT. Like there are six core processes of change, and we've just talked about one. We've talked about experiential avoidance or acceptance. So it's important for our listeners to not have this idea that ACT is all about exactly just one thing that make room for your emotions, but there's like five others and they're all intertwined and they work together. And I think maybe we can um, put a little bit of a spotlight on dealing with unhelpful thoughts. For In my own experience, I found that that is something that clicks with the end user, if you will, a little bit faster because we're mostly dealing with overthinkers and overanalyzers that are paralyzed by that. And to uh, look at the thought process that's going on and how to disarm that a little bit and, and make it more useful in the service of our values and our goals, can we take a little detour and, and look at that facet of ACT as well, maybe? Absolutely. I think that's an important one because often people do get in that pattern of overthinking, of self-criticism. We get into some narratives around our work roles that, you know, where we might be experiencing burnout. So for instance, you know, I have to achieve to feel worthy. I can't take a break. You know, we have these beliefs that add fuel to the fire of burnout, so to speak, right? So often people are cynical, negative, fixated on blame, or I mean, all kinds of interesting things can happen at the level of your thoughts when you're in a place of stress and burnout. I mean, you know, you're up all night worrying about all the things you have to do, or just, you know, you can think of your own experience of how your thoughts are going in terms of their content when you're really stressed out, right? You don't really see things in a very balanced point of view. And so with acceptance and commitment therapy, we work on what's they usually call it cognitive diffusion, which is about getting some distance from your thoughts, right? Seeing them for what they are, taking a step back from them so that instead of being so consumed by those types of thoughts and narratives and beliefs, we can see them for what they are. So you might say something like, wow, I'm being really hard on myself today, or I'm really feeling like it's the end of the world if I don't get this project done perfectly on time. And we can take a step back and say, well, you know, the world will probably keep on spinning and at least see that for what it is. And there is something about the process of doing that that can be really helpful, I think, to get just a more balanced perspective on things. Because when we're in that place, it just, it feels like that's the truth, you know? And so I think that when when people are in that place and they can start to do a little bit of that work, they can really see a big transformation. And if anyone is listening to this is wondering what are those beliefs or narratives or feelings that they're tied to that they need to diffuse from or get some space from, well, we went over five of those personas earlier, the busy bee, the perfectionist, the people pleaser. Now, you may not think of yourself initially as a people pleaser, But if you're one of those people who is at work and you want to do all of these things so that everyone around you is happy and in a good mood and feeling good, right? That is a belief that you are holding to yourself that is, that is creating these stressors. Yeah. Uh, And it can be so subtle. I, I think even the way that our work sometimes becomes a really big part of our identity and we start to think, well, I have to do a good job at this in order to be accepted or acceptable to others. So it really kind of comes down to a fundamental sense of worthiness and wanting to feel valued by others and a sense of belonging. But it can become so extreme that it's like, well, if I don't perform at the top level in this particular role, then you know, it's it's almost like, then who am I? And that's where, again, that slippery slope, like it's okay to have work that you care. It's great to have work that you care about and to be attached to your work. But if it, if you over-identify with your work role, you know, then your your life gets pretty upended when that's not going well, or we lose other parts of ourselves and we lose, again, psychological flexibility. If, if all I am is my work role, 
you know, what about the other parts of my life? Right. And with that, you know, we've seen in a lot of our clients that identity take over to the detriment of relationships and community in their life. And when they join the X Factor Accelerator community or they work with us and they find other people are also going through this burnout, are also recognizing that that work identity has grown in such a way that they've let relationships slide, time with their spouse, significant other slide. They've chose to focus more on the things they can control than just be open and honest and vulnerable with people in their life. It actually creates that isolation that we talked about earlier that can be very fertile ground for the burnout and can can actually make the burnout worse. And I think right now, I, I'm very curious as someone who sees a lot of patients with burnout, is there a seasonality to it? I found in working with our clients that there is a lot of sense of I didn't achieve as much as I wanted to this year or I didn't see those goals that I had. And now they're reminded of that and they're feeling really overwhelmed with this sense of dread or the sense that they didn't make the year that they wanted happen. And with that, making more and more choices that lead to further burnout or don't even recognize that part of the reason they're feeling that at the end of the year is due to burnout. Yeah, that's a good question. I definitely think that there, back to this idea of context, that there are situational factors above and beyond just the regular work that you do that can contribute to burnout. So yeah, holiday season, end of the year, a lot of jobs are very busy during that win- those winter months. And then of course you have the darkness and the cold and that kind of thing. You know, we also live in a world where there's a lot happening in the news and, you know, that fluctuates over the course of time. And here at this particular moment that we're recording this, there's just, it's winter. A lot of people's jobs are very busy, short staffed. And then you look at the news and read about all kinds of just really distressing, upsetting things happening. And and maybe there's always some level of that, but I think you almost get into this perfect storm situation where... You have these moments in time in your life where it just feels like a lot. And so absolutely, depending on the seasonal nature of your particular job, that can absolutely be the case. As much as you go on any social media and see all the incredibly terrible things that are happening at all times all around the world, how much is actually affecting you and your day-to-day, everyday life? Sure, you want to be involved. Sure, uh, you, you want to get uh, feel like, hey, I have a hand in in, in, in helping this or, or any of those things, and 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 that's great. But at the end of the day, you have yourself and your obligations and your responsibilities that need pretty much a lot of your focus, if not all of it. Well, for many, I think the slippery slope is that escapism that, you know, the media and the news provide of like, hey, you know, let me just scroll a little bit more. (laughs) I'm feeling overwhelmed. Let me get some digital dopamine. And, And of course, the news headlines can be, you know, negative and compounding to that stress that you're feeling. I think for those in the audience who uh, might be feeling this way or now recognizing it, it, I'm curious to hear from you what the road to recovery looks like. I know it's different for everyone and I know it's co- more complex and sometimes simpler for others to entangle themselves. But you know, when you do find patients in this state of burnout, you know, if you could just paint a rough picture of what it looks like to, to get yourself back to normal and feeling good and, and moving forward. Well, we talked about some of the internal things that you can do already. Um, I think that sometimes it can also be worthwhile to take a look at, okay, what needs to change? How can I reconnect to what matters to me, to purpose, to vitality? And so I think sometimes we can do that in small ways, and sometimes we can do that in big ways. Sometimes people want to make a really big change, like leaving their job. Sometimes people need to leave a situation, like a very toxic workplace or something like that. Sometimes people, maybe it might be a smaller scale thing, like reaching out for more support than they have been. It could be setting a boundary like for myself, I'm not going to check the news after 7 p.m. It doesn't do the world any good for me to be doom scrolling. So that's maybe a boundary that someone might want to set, you know, or it could be taking a look at how they're using their time and making a shift there. You know, if people are finding that they're just maxed out, they might need to kind of redistribute things in terms of their schedule. And it can be sometimes some of those daily habits. Like I really need to stop with the alcohol at night. That's not helping me. I need to 
get more sleep or I don't know, some of those little kinds of day-to-day things that can help you recharge. But the main thing I would say if I was going to give one blanket piece of advice really does go back to that thing we've talked about multiple times already, which is getting support. You know, I think often when people are burned out, they're not necessarily asking for help or talking to anybody about what's going on. It could be coworkers. Maybe you need them to pitch in and help you out. It could be just someone in your personal life to say, I'm really struggling. I need some support. It could be a professional. You know, you could, if it's really bad burnout, you could reach out to get some professional help from a therapist or a coach or something. So, yeah, I mean, again, it really kind of depends on your situation, but I do think one thing that burnout can do is make us take a look at what's working and what's not working and what needs to change. And from there, we can maybe get to a better place. That room for reflection around so many of those key areas, as you talked about, and I know one of the pieces that uh, that we do with our clients is look at habits and there are positive habits and there are negative habits. And sometimes those negative habits can take over, like having one too many glasses of wine that then ruins their sleep and doesn't get into the gym in the morning. And a helpful visual of, okay, what's going on with some of these habits that I've worked on? Are, am I letting them slide? Are they in the yellow? Are they red uh, for time, for a long period of time? Can really be that warning sign of like, okay, I'm, I'm putting myself vitality wise in a state where chronic stress is really going to put me in a place uh, potentially for burnout or actually I'm in burnout. Mm -hmm. And also recognizing that there are small steps we can take now. Maybe it's some vulnerability. Maybe it's even sharing this podcast episode with some friends to open a discussion around how you're feeling about it as a way to say, hey, are, are you feeling this way too? Are you maybe recognizing some of these signs in me that I myself am struggling to see I know for me and my wife, that was really key in in moments where I was really struggling with burnout, her recognizing like, you know, I'm not the type of person in in traffic to use the horn and screen obscenities, but, you know, a couple weeks in a row of me getting really bent out of shape in traffic, it's like, what's going on? Well, I'm really stressed at work and I'm really stressed that I'm not meeting the deadlines that I have for myself and letting down my team. And it's allowing me now to act out of character in traffic in LA. Um, You know, those are the simple conversations that we could start to have with our loved ones too. And I know it can be delicate. I'd love to just hear your perspective on if we recognize some of these signs and symptoms in others, how can we maybe start to have that conversation to help support those around us who are struggling with burnout if we ourselves might not be feeling it? Yeah, I absolutely think so. I mean, this is where a little self-awareness, but also checking in with people who might notice the signs in ourself is really key. And so having that level, having that ability to look at yourself, I'll give a personal example just this morning. So I'm leaving on a massive holiday road trip tomorrow. I have a really long to-do list. I knew I had this interview today. I have a few clients. I'm just, and I was sitting there, I could just feel my nerves buzzing in my body and my mind was all over the place. And I said to myself, I did not have a whole lot of time this morning before my first appointment at 9 a.m. I said, I have to exercise. It's only going to be 20 minutes. It's going to come at the cost of, you know, doing my hair and all that kind of thing. I just, I can feel the stress in my body. And so I did it. And I think that that's the moment, right, where we can maybe do something different that's going to help us recharge a little bit, help us through that situation versus my instinct would be to say, I'm going to do as much as I can possibly get done in this 20 minutes. Um, But it's that intentionality. And so, yeah, absolutely. And I hope conversations like this one help prevent burnout, because I think if you can catch some of this earlier, you don't get to that point where you hate your life, you hate your job, you're completely exhausted for months on end. That's my hope anyway, because I think I found since that period in my own life, I can catch it earlier, talk about it, make some changes, set some boundaries, take care of myself, and then it doesn't get to that extreme point. That is certainly the ideal outcome. And thank you so much for taking time with us today from your busy schedule. We love asking every one of our guests what their X factor is. What do you think makes you unique and extraordinary, Debbie? Uh, I think I'm pretty brave. I don't know if this is that extraordinary, but I think sometimes I'm willing to kind of go for it with things like, you know, starting my own podcast or just, you know, kind of putting this book out there or something like that. I don't know if it's anything I'm doing is truly that extraordinary, but I do I think I have a certain level of of courage that I'm proud of. So I'll, I'll, I'll go with that. 
Well, we're proud of your courage as well in writing the book, and I assure it's going to be very helpful to a number of members of our audience who might be feeling some of these warning signals we talked about on this episode. Well, thanks. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. It was great having you. Where can our audience find out more about you and the book? Yeah, I mean, the book's pretty easy to find, Act for Burnout. So anywhere you like to buy your books. Um, I'm online at drdebbysorensen.com is my webpage. I have a blog there, and I'm also on some social media. And then, of course, my podcast, Psychologist Off the Clock, which I think is kind of a, a cousin of yours because we have had some yeah. overlap quite a bit, especially Michael's <laughs> engagement in both. So if you like hearing the sound of my voice, there's plenty more on Psychologist Off the Clock. <laughs> Thank you, Debbie. Thanks so much. Thank you.